In this lecture, you'll get a quick review of the normal heart functions before you learn about the signs and symptoms and complications of heart failure. Please make note of the normal values listed here for cardiac output, heart rate, stroke volume, and ejection fraction. The heart is a pump made up of cardiac muscle tissue. It can be divided into two sides, the right side and the left side of the heart. The job of the right side of the heart is to accept deoxygenated blood that's coming from the body and then pump that deoxygenated blood out to the lungs. The job of the left side of the heart is to accept the oxygenated blood that's coming back from the lungs and then pump that oxygenated blood out to the entire body. Heart failure is when the heart cannot perform these normal functions. And there are many types of, um, there are many causes of heart failure and many complications that accompany um, these causes of heart failure. So recall from anatomy and physiology, the pulmonary and, system and systemic circuits of the circulatory system. We see here that deoxygenated blood in blue is coming from the body and it is being accepted into the right atrium of the heart. This deoxygenated blood crosses the tricuspid valve and enters the right ventricle. From there, blood passes through the pulmonary valve as it's being pumped out to the lungs to pick up oxygen. As the oxygenated blood returns from the lungs to the heart, it enters the left atrium, crosses the mitral valve as it enters the left ventricle. Recall that the left ventricle is larger than the right ventricle because it has to pump the blood out to the entire body with much more force than it does when it pumps blood to the lungs. Blood leaving the left ventricle crosses the aortic valve, enters the aorta, and is pumped out to the body. Cardiac output is one of the determinants of normal heart function. It's the amount of blood that the heart pumps out in one minute and is dependent on heart rate and stroke volume. These are both dependent on a number of different factors. Heart rate is the number of times the heart contracts per minute and stroke volume is the amount of blood ejected from the heart per pump. Heart rate depends on the conduction system of the heart and also the ability of the myocardial cells to respond to the electric stimulus. The myocardial cells are those cells of the heart that actually contract when the heart is pumping blood through the body. Stroke volume depends on three factors, preload, cardiac contractility, and afterload. Preload is the amount of stretch during diastole. The more the heart stretches, the greater the force must be during systole, when the heart contracts. Cardiac contractility is the strength of the heart muscle contractions, how strong the heart is contracting to pump blood out into the body. And afterload is the amount of force the heart must use to overcome the resistance of preload when pumping blood out of the heart during systole. These factors are often compared to a slingshot imagining the ventricles of the heart as a slingshot. If you could pull the walls of the ventricles back like a slingshot, 
they would fill with blood as they stretch. This is what happens during diastole, relaxing of the heart muscles. The more the heart stretches, the greater the force must be to pump all of the blood out of the heart that has entered it into it. During afterload, release of the slingshot is equated to contraction of the ventricles as they are pushing the blood out to the lungs or out to the body. The ventricles have to push with enough force to overcome the resistance of the preload to get blood out of the heart during systole. These factors that are determinants of stroke volume also depend on several different factors themselves. Preload is dependent on how much space is actually inside the chambers of the heart to accept blood. If there is a problem that decreases the size of the heart chambers, this will decrease the amount of blood able to enter the heart. It also depends on how much blood enters the heart in the first place. The size of the chambers could be normal, but the amount of blood entering them could be decreased or increased for several reasons. Cardiac contractility depends on the health of the myocardial cells. Are they able to contract? Are they receiving and responding to the electrical stimuli, etc.? Norepinephrine and acetylcholine also have an effect on these myocardial cells. Afterload depends on resistance in vessels that are leading away from the heart to the lungs or the periphery vessels. If there are blockages in these vessels or vasoconstriction, the heart has to contract with greater strength or greater force to overcome that resistance in those vessels. Resistance in vessels leading to the lungs is considered pulmonary vascular resistance. And resistance in vessels leading to the body is systemic vac vascular resistance. <clears throat> You can click on this link in the PowerPoint to watch a video about cardiac output. Please take a few minutes to work through this mini case in the PowerPoint and answer the questions on your own before revealing the answers. Another term to consider is ejection fraction which is the amount of blood that is pumped from the left ventricle during systole. Keep in mind that the amount of blood pumped out is not equal to the amount of blood that enters. Of the blood that enters the heart, it is normal for only 55 to 75 percent of that volume to be ejected from the heart during a contraction. The ejection fraction can be within normal limits, but the volume that is ejected can be low. You can click on this link here to learn more about ejection fraction in the PowerPoint. About half of the people with heart failure have lowered ejection fractions. That is, when their ventricles contract, they don't effectively pump blood out of the heart. So a normal amount of blood is entering the heart, but the ventricles have a problem where they are not contracting with enough force to pump out 55 to 75% of the blood that enters. And therefore the ejection fraction is lowered. This is also called systolic heart failure because the ventricles pump or contract during systole. The other half of the people with heart failure have a preserved ejection fraction. They pump a normal percentage of the blood out of the ventricle, but a decreased amount of blood enters the ventricle in the first place. 
This is also called diastolic heart failure because the ventricles fill during diastole. So in this case, for example, think about what is half of 100 milliliters? 50 milliliters. Half of 10 milliliters is five milliliters. So in the case of these people with the preserved ejection fraction, they still pump out this, a normal percentage of the blood from the ventricle, whether um, it's 55% or all, up, up to 75%. They can, their, their ventricles are still contracting with enough force to pump out 55 to 75%. And so for this reason, the ejection fraction is normal, but there is a decreased amount of blood that's entering the ventricle in the first place. So instead of maybe 100 milliliters entering the, ventri entering the ventricle, maybe only 60 or 50 milliliters of blood is entering the ventricle. But because the ventricle can still function properly and contract with the right amount of force, it is still pumping out half of whatever volume has entered, be it half of 100 mils or half of the 60 milliliters. I hope that makes sense. Both groups of these people with lowered ejection fractions and with preserved ejection fractions have a decreased cardiac output, but for different reasons. The people with lowered ejection fractions have issues because their ventricles are not effectively contracting to pump out a normal percentage of the blood entering the heart and the people with preserved ejection fractions that have a normal percentage of blood being pumped out the ventricle have problems with the amount of blood that's entering their ventricles. So both have decreased cardiac output, but for those two different reasons. Take a few minutes to think about these questions and the questions on the next slide before revealing the answers in the PowerPoint. On this slide are some mechanisms leading to signs and symptoms of heart failure. You should be able to discuss the mechanisms that lead to um, the signs and symptoms that are noted in red. Heart failure is a decrease in the amount of circulating blood. Whether that blood is circulating out to the lungs or out to the body, it's a decrease in the amount of circulating blood. The body is going to detect that decrease in blood pressure. And when there's a decrease in blood pressure, a couple of different pathways are going to be activated. We'll start with the GSR being activated. When the GSR is activated, we know that the GSR is trying to increase heart rate, increase heart strength, trying to pump more blood through the, through the heart, out to the body. This is going to be, um, th these messages are going to be received by the beta-1 receptors and norepinephrine is going to play a role in this. Also, the alpha-1 receptors are going to play a role in vasoconstriction of blood vessels. Vasoconstriction of blood vessels in the GI tract, the skin, the kidneys are going to help to increase the blood pressure. 
When the body detects a decrease in blood pressure, the RAS system, renin angiotensin aldosterone system is also going to be activated. We know that renin is going to be produced. Um, it's going to interact with angiotensin, angi well, angiotensinogen. Um, eventually, angiotensin is going to be produced. Recall that angiotensin is a vasoconstrictor, so it's going to further um, play a role in vasoconstriction and increasing that blood pressure. Angiotensin II is a stronger vasoconstrictor that's going to add to um, that increase in blood pressure. Aldosterone is going to be released, and we know that is going to cause the sodium potassium pump to become activated. Once this pump becomes activated, that will lead to two potassiums being secreted into the urine, and then three sodiums are going to be reabsorbed back into the blood and water is going to follow. This is going to cause an increase in blood volume and therefore an increase in blood pressure. So together with all these, uh, the vasoconstrictors, um, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, as well as the action of the GSR in vasoconstriction, those are going to lead to an increase in peripheral resistance because you have all these vessels being constricted. And in turn, the peripheral resistance will lead to an increase in blood pressure. So I pose this question to you. Would running this system continuously make your heart better or would it make it worse and why? Take a few moments to think about this question, going through these pathways leading to the signs and symptoms of heart failure before you reveal the answer. The body has several compensatory mechanisms to keep cardiac output the same and to help protect the overworked heart. Adaptations to keep cardiac output the same include activation of the GSR, the sympathetic nervous system, and renin angiotensin aldosterone system as seen in the last slide. Being that the heart is a muscular pump, if it's overworked, it can increase in size like any other muscle. When the heart enlarges, it can also become weak and stretchy, so it can't efficiently pump blood out to the body. This can cause a number of complications um, like cardiac arrest and death being the most severe. When the heart is overworked and overstretched, recall that the atria and ventricles produce atrial natriuretic peptides and B-type natriuretic peptides in response. B and P levels can be measured in the blood. They can signal heart failure and can also be measured to monitor drug treatment. So the heart responds to overstretched chambers by secreting these AMPs and BMPs. Both AMPs and BMPs cause the body to excrete sodium and water in the urine. This will result in a decrease in blood volume and in turn, a decrease in blood pressure, which can relieve stress on the overstretched and overworked heart. But keep in mind that AMPs and BMPs are like a band-aid on a large wound. They don't solve the problem of the overstretched heart. Take a few moments to work through this slide, naming the major vessels and valves of the pulmonary and systemic circuits. 
Also, take some time to work through this slide. What are some signs and symptoms of left heart failure? Think about how left heart failure will affect the circulatory pathways you named in the previous slide. What signs and symptoms are likely and the mechanisms that lead to those signs and symptoms? Pause the video here before moving forward. So decreased blood to the kidneys is a result of left heart failure and heart failure in, in general. This is going to cause an increase in red blood cell production and this is going to lead to polycythemia if left untreated. Fluid overload can also lead to edema. There can be an increase in blood volume, but you can't pump the blood out to the body effectively, so it will accumulate in the lungs. This will lead to difficulty breathing, increase in pulmonary blood pressure, also termed pulmonary hypertension. The lungs are very delicate, so fluid will leak out of the vessels that supply the lungs into the tissues. This will call, cause pulmonary edema and a productive cough because of the buildup of the fluid, <clears throat> excuse me, of the fluid in the lungs. The tissue fills with fluid and it also leaks into the alveoli. This will cause shortness of breath. Um, you may also hear some rails or lung sounds um, during normal breathing. Also, because the capillaries that surround the alveoli can't pick up enough oxygen, you may also witness some cyanosis. Orthopnea um, may also occur where the person has a hard time breathing when they lay down because of the fluid buildup. Also, because they usually are laying down at night to go to bed, they can't breathe very well at night. This is called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, not being able to breathe well at night. Treatment for left heart failure can be um, use of a diuretic to decrease blood volume, um, increase urination and therefore decrease blood volume, uh, elevate the head of the bed, um, prescribe beta blockers to decrease the workload on the heart. A very, very old and archaic treatment was to bleed patients. Um, that is, make an incision and allow them to bleed out, this would decrease blood volume and therefore decrease blood pressure. Again, work through this slide for right-sided heart failure as you did for left-sided heart failure before revealing the answers. You can pause the video here and then work through the slide in the PowerPoint before moving forward. Once again, pause the video and work through this slide. Keep in mind the diagnosis at the end of this mini case study as congestive heart failure. Do a search to find out what congestive heart failure is before working through the slide. That might help you. So this patient has all the signs of left heart failure and pulmonary edema. The lungs have filled with blood and the right heart has to work harder to pump blood from the heart into the lung. So the right heart starts to fail because the left heart has so many problems. 
And when the right heart starts to fail because of the problems with the left heart, this is what congestive heart failure is. It's a progressive, pro, it's a progressive um, condition and it will continue to get worse if the root problem is not treated. So make sure to take time to go through these slides and um, try to answer the questions on your own before revealing the answers. It will help reinforce the lecture material.